Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's been a long time since I've been down here, first time in the new building. Nice to see so many faces, some familiar and many not. And what I want to do is tell you about this uh, funny bit of quantum measurement we've been interested in lately, how to count one photon and get an average result of a thousand. So I, I seem to be attached to these paradoxical things like light traveling faster than light, but hopefully by the end you'll see that there's a really down-to-earth experiment behind this about quantum light matter interfaces. Um, so that's, that's us crossing the beams, quantum light matter interfaces. But before I jump into that, I thought it would be nice to talk about some of our more recent work and uh, back to the Chateaubriand analogy, I'm going to think in terms of food. We're going to begin with Little Entrée, which will be uh, our latest work on classical imaging. And I just enjoyed this because it is so different from anything that we've worked on in my group in the past, but it's inspired by quantum metrology. So the idea is that by thinking about quantum aspects of information, one can come up with new ideas for metrological applications or imaging applications. And in this case, it's really just better resolution through not throwing out the phase information. Phase matters, not maybe that surprising. And then the main course will be this how to count a single photon. What that's really about is giant optical nonlinearities, how to get photons to interact with each other. In particular, we observe a nonlinear phase shift that's driven by a single post-selected photon. And then we'll talk about some of the weird stuff, this thing known as weak value amplification, where you can make a single photon act like a thousand photons. And we can argue a little bit about whether that's useful for anything or not metrologically. That's a bit of an open question. We think we've come down to an answer, which is, yes, it is useful, but no more useful than something else you already know about. And I'm desperately looking for a case where our version is easier than what you already know. And I haven't found one yet. Uh, and then if there's time, for dessert, we'll look at some cold atoms work. I just want to show you some pictures of what we've got set up in the lab these days. So let me begin by just giving credit to the people who really did this experiment. The main course was built up by Amir Fezpour, Greg Dmachowski, and Mateen Halaji, taken over more recently by Josiah Sinclair and a few others. That's on the um, uh, EIT experiments for doing light matter interactions and nonlinearities. The imaging work was done by Hugo Ferretti and Edwin Tham. And the uh, BEC work that I'll show you, Shreyas Potnes, was instrumental in building up what we've got right now. And it's now been taken over by Ramon Ramos and David Spearings. So here for the appetizer, better imaging as a quantum state discrimination problem. Let us think of a toy problem. This is imaging for idiots. Uh, suppose we have two objects, like a binary star, and we want to get some information about them. And we're going to make it even more of a toy problem. That's really just two point sources, as far as I'm concerned. So the question is, how well can we tell that there are two point sources, or how far apart they are? And we all know this stuff. If there's some width to our point spread function, you know, the resolution of our telescope or our microscope, then we can't resolve things that are separated by less than the width of that distribution. That's the Rayleigh criterion. But of course, we don't take that too literally when we say we can't resolve it. If you've got lots and lots of photons, and I give you a picture like that, you can tell that there were two sources, and you can get some information about the separation. But let's think about what happens as the separation gets smaller and smaller and smaller. There are still two spots here. How well can I tell the separation between those two spots, even if you tell me? I know there are two point sources. I know the point spread function of my telescope. I just want to know the distance between those two stars. Well, I might have said, since my uncertainty in each of these spots is some sigma, the width of this distribution, but you gave me n photons, it probably goes down as root n. Maybe I could tell this separation to sigma over root n. I don't know how many of you would believe that. I, I've, I've been taught several times in a row that that's not true, and I keep forgetting it. But by now, because of the 2014, I think, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, we should all be aware that it's not that easy, and it takes special tricks to, in fact, resolve what's going on over here. For instance, if you could make those stars turn on and off randomly, it would get a lot easier. And we can do that with molecules, but we can't do that with stars. So what's really going on is that if I gave you one spot and asked you how well can you tell where the center is, sigma over root n would have been the right answer. But when I give you these two spots, all that really looks like eventually is a broadened Gaussian. And our job is to measure how broad is it. 
So the question is not how accurately can you tell where the center of a distribution is. How accurately can you measure the width of the distribution? How uncertain is your estimate of an uncertainty, in other words? And that's a harder thing to do. Well, as I guess NIST people know. So the answer is the following. The width of this thing is just given by a variance, right? I want to know the RMS. I calculate the expectation value of x squared. If you then want to know the uncertainty in your estimate of that width, you can play the same game and calculate the square of the variance and so on and so forth. And it's not that interesting to lead you through the math, although it was fun when I discovered that you could actually do it in a few lines because it had us confused before then. But if you work through it, what you find is after taking n data points, your uncertainty in the variance certainly goes as 1 over root n. But it's something like the variance divided by root n, scales with the variance itself. So how are we going to turn that measurement of the width into a measurement of a separation? If we've got two spots, and each one of them makes a little circle of width sigma, but they're separated by s, the width of the whole distribution is now the square root of sigma squared plus s squared. So from our uncertainty in this variance v, we can figure out what the uncertainty is in s. And again, I won't lead you through the math, but it's just a few lines of error propagation. The important thing on the right is it is not just equal to sigma over root n. It's equal to sigma squared over s times something like 1 over root n. So as that separation s goes to 0, it's not just that these small numbers are hard to measure relative to the uncertainty sigma. It's that the uncertainty actually goes up while the thing you're trying to measure goes down. So this is what Manke Tsang has termed Rayleigh's curse. Yeah. V is the variance. So it's the uh, mean squared separation from the center. So the square root of V is the width of the distribution. OK? So <clears throat> the width is the quadrature sum of the individual point source width and the separation between those two points. OK? So as S goes to 0, this thing actually diverges. And this is what was pointed out in a series of papers by Manke Tsang and his collaborators. Uh, theorists think in terms of Fisher information, but basically that's one over the uncertainty you can get. And as you change the separation of the two sources, make it smaller and smaller going to the left here, what they showed is you could always get information about the centroid, where the, the center is, it kind of dips down and comes back up for some odd reason. But if you wanted to know about the separation, that's this red curve over here, and it drops to zero as the separation goes to zero. In the limit of point sources that are separated by much less than sigma, you get no information at all about the separation. All right? Strictly, what that means is that the uncertainty, the error of any unbiased estimator of the separation goes to infinity in the limit where that separation goes to zero. But you see there's another curve here. And uh, what Manke and his buddies did is calculate not just this classical Fisher information, but the quantum Fisher information, the total amount of information present in the electromagnetic field that's hitting your screen. In other words, including not just the intensity, but also the phase. And they found that that remains constant. So the moral of the story is the electromagnetic field still has all the information in the image plane, but it's not encoded in the intensity. And when we just look at the intensity image, we lose that. It's actually there in the phase. So the question is, how do you get at that phase information? And basically, this is a quantum state discrimination problem. If you imagine one photon that's either in this distribution or that distribution, those are hard to tell apart. These are just like displaced coherent states. Their overlap is something like e to the minus delta squared. But if I put n photons in such a mode, then the overlap between the n photon states is just this thing raised to the nth power becomes e to the minus n delta squared. And you'll realize that if n delta squared is big, then these become orthogonal states again, distinguishable quantum states. That just means that the separation delta has to be bigger than 1 over root n. OK, so that's what we already knew. Well, what about distinguishing two spots? Maybe we have two spots separated by s. Maybe we have two spots separated by s plus delta. If you think of these spots as mixed states of a photon, over here at 0 and a photon over there at s, when you work out this overlap, it actually turns out to be the same kind of thing as what happens here. It still drops as uh, e to the minus n delta squared, but you can't see it just from the intensity distribution. You have to find a different way to distinguish those two things. 
So how would you distinguish a spot that's at zero and a spot that's separated by some small amount? Quantum mechanically, the way to think about it is to remember that this spot positioned at delta can be rewritten as a kind of TEM00 mode, a Gaussian centered at zero, plus some contribution of an odd term. That would be the first order expansion of a displaced Gaussian, right? TEM00 plus a little bit of TEM01, <coughs> okay? Well, <clears throat> in that case, if we could project onto the TEM01 mode, we'd get really good information about the displacement of this spot. And in our experiment, we decided we were going to try to be the first. We ended up being one of the four simultaneous groups. So thank God we did it quick and dirty, because if we tried to do it carefully, we would have been you know, another year. The quick and dirty method is to realize you don't have to project onto TEM01. You could project onto any odd parity mode you like. And for us, the easiest odd parity mode was to take this Gaussian and just write a pi phase shift on half of it. And that's fine. That's orthogonal to the original Gaussian. And as you displace a spot, you start getting some overlap with that thing. So again, we can go through the error analysis, but the important thing is just that the probability of getting into this mode is proportional to the square of some amplitude that grows linearly with position. So you've got some probability of getting a click that goes like S squared. There's some numerical constants there, but it doesn't really matter. And we're now gonna have binomial or Poisson statistics on that count rate. And again, just go through the propagation. You can find out when you back out the uncertainty in S that it really looks like sigma over root n. It's now independent of the separation. So it's just saying to find out that this spot has displaced, if it was only one spot, you could just look at the intensity and get the information, or you could look at the projection onto the PEM01 or some other odd mode. But once you've got two overlapping spots, the intensity gets washed out, but the projection onto this odd mode works fine. It doesn't matter whether I project to the right or to the left. That gives me the same fraction of counts in this odd mode. So this is a really good way of measuring the two. And in fact, it saturates the quantum limit on what you can do. Sorry, if you use the TEM01 mode, it saturates the quantum limit of what you could do. The fact that we do this kludgy, you know, sharp pi phase shift means we don't get all the way there. So here's how Hugo and Edwin did the experiment. They set up a funny sort of sanyak looking loop so that as we sent one beam in here and one beam in here, a displacement of this mirror would symmetrically separate two spots, leaving their center fixed. So we now know that we've got a double spot coming out with a variable separation. All we have to do is project this onto that funny odd mode that we have. So we know how to project onto the TEM00. We've already fiber coupled all this light. Whatever gets into the fiber is TEM00. All we have to do is add to that a pi phase shift. So we want to put a pi, a pi phase shift on one half of that pattern, which we do by taking a pair of microscope cover slips indicated over here and tilting one of them until no light gets into the fiber anymore. At that point, we know we're projecting onto some odd mode, something orthogonal to the original spot. And as we change this separation, we just monitor the number of counts that get into the fiber. Here's the theory. If you look at this uh, dashed curve here, that's what happens with classical imaging, the classical Fisher information. And it goes to zero at small separations. If you look at Tsang's paper, you find that the simplest technique that you can do, what he calls binary spade, where you only look at the TEM00, the TEM01, it's not designed to do well at large separations, but at small separations, it gives you the full Fisher information. It's one over here. And our technique that cheats a little bit has a similar shape, but it only gets about 2 thirds of the way there. We don't get all the information, but we get the right scaling. It doesn't go to zero. That's what we wanted to check. So we carried this out. <coughs> here versus actual separation that we dial in is inferred separation for image plane counting, just classical imaging and our splice technique. And what you see is they look similar up here at big separations, but below about the RMS width, the noise in this uh, image plane counting technique really goes up, whereas in splice, things remain roughly constant. And we can analyze that more quantitatively, show you the standard deviation. And sure enough, at low separations, we've got this kind of flat um, standard deviation for our good technique, splice, whereas there is a divergence 
for the image plane counting. And this is a Monte Carlo that shows that. It begins to diverge. And of course, you'll notice it doesn't really diverge. And in fact, that's a good lesson for the experimentalists. If a theorist says, if you do things in this regime, the information goes to zero, the uncertainty goes to infinity, they're probably <coughs> leaving something out, right? You're not going to get zero information from this measurement. And sure enough, you don't. Can you just say one more time what SPLICE stood for? Oh dear, I didn't say it any times because I always forget we worked so hard to make that acronym. Uh, super resolved position localization by inversion of coherence about an edge. Uh, <laughs> there, there were six other proposed techniques for this that all had nice names like spade. So you know we needed something you could pronounce. Um, so here's what the data end up looking like if we average for what? Yep. Sorry, right, no, the, the, the picture was schematic. The point is we vary that separation until they're also unresolved. The, the separation, we let it go to zero. There are other practical questions that are interesting. Here we've made a lot of simplifying assumptions. I'm assuming that I have two, well, I'm, I'm assuming that I know where the geometric center of the system is. If I knew that the two stars had exactly the same brightness, that would be easy to find. But if they have different brightnesses, then first I need to find out how bright each one is, get some other information before I would know the right projection to do. Manke has begun doing some work on this, and there are a few articles that claim that even when you look at all that overhead, this technique is still a good idea. I want to go through it more carefully before I swear to anything. But I, I think those are the open questions, that you'd really want some kind of adaptive technique. What we've seen is that if you know enough about the state, there's an optimal projection you can do that's much better than classical imaging. But if I give you some unknown image, what you're going to want to do is get as much information from a naive measurement as you can, and then based on that, say, oh, here's the smarter thing to do next. And there should probably be a whole bunch of steps of processing there. And I don't know the final scaling. Yeah. So what we have here is, again, for the two techniques, the black circles are showing an average of many runs, showing the estimator, the inferred separation that we get versus actual separation. Sorry, I lied. The black is the splice technique, and the uh, empty circles are the image plane counting. And uh, what you see is that as you come down here, although the standard deviation grows a little bit, the other thing that happens is you just don't get the right answer. You don't stay on the 45 degree line. And the problem is you're trying to estimate a separation really the square of a separation, something that's guaranteed to be positive. And as that goes to zero, there's no way to keep making an unbiased estimator of it. Right? You're going to have some uncertainties, but you know that S squared can't be negative. So you're always going to estimate some positive number with some uncertainty. If the separation were actually zero, you would always overestimate that. You can't underestimate zero. So what you have here is a biased estimator. And if you listened really carefully when I defined the Fisher information before, I said that it put a bound on the lowest uncertainty an unbiased estimator could have. And the theorists always say that. And I always drop the word unbiased because I think, why wouldn't I use an unbiased estimator? Who wants a biased estimator? But this is the answer. This is a case where the estimator is naturally biased. And of course, you know, experimentalists again will look at this and say, all right, but if you know that, just undo it, right? Invert this function. You could invert the function, but it comes in here with zero slope. So if you invert it, you end up multiplying the uncertainties here by infinity. So if you try to straighten out the hockey stick, as we like to say up north, now that you don't believe in hockey sticks down here. Um, <laughs> sorry, I promised myself I wasn't going to have any jokes, but I couldn't, couldn't do it. Uh, you end up with infinite uncertainty. All right. So if instead of looking at the uh, standard deviation, you look at the actual RMS error, you find that for the classical imaging, it grows even more relative to the, uh, the quantum imaging here. We're almost down at the quantum limit. And the interesting thing is that this imaging becomes dominated by the bias, not by the standard deviation. And that bias still drops as you count more photons, but it only drops as n to the 1 fourth instead of the square root of n. So there's a real scaling advantage to this other imaging method. Okay. And as I said, there are lots of open questions about what one can do with this imaging in the future when you're given an interesting image and not two spots that are prearranged to have the same intensity. But I think it opens up a nice set of questions about how we can better image. Yeah? So 
what am I missing? So, uh, <laughs> Where should I begin, yeah, Helen? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can look at the, say, the standard deviation in the other direction, if I assume it's in the spherical. Uh -huh. And I can subtract that from the standard deviation I get in this one direction and include the positive and negative, which even though the negatives are not visible, visible uh, and see the uncertainty blow up, doesn't that get rid of the bias? I, I think you can get rid of the bias, but the uncertainty will blow up. It'll go back to the calculation I showed at the beginning, where you have this sigma squared over s prefactor for the uncertainty and the separation. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you can have it either way. You can have an infinite uncertainty and no bias, or you can have a finite uncertainty that drops as n to the 1 fourth, but then you have to accept the bias. And are, uh, are you taking into account the fact that you can actually measure the other direction, the information? I think it's an independent degree of freedom. It's not gonna. It's not gonna help you. Or sorry. Again, I've assumed that I already know the point spread function. So you're right. If I didn't know that, but you told me I have two stars and I know they're separated along the horizontal axis, then right, I could use the vertical as my estimate of the width. But then I'd be back in the same boat after I did that. All right. All right. So on to the main course: uh, how to count a single photon and get a result of 100. This is going to have a few parts. Probably won't leave time for dessert after all. Um, we're going to begin. In this country, we call this the entree. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I'm actually from here. I know that. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> Quantum non-demolition measurements uh, using weak or giant nonlinearities. Uh, the words weak and giant are confusing. There are nonlinearities that are called which way does this go? Right. Weak if you're a theorist, but turn out to be giant if you're an experimentalist. Uh, the goal, of course, is quantum nonlinear optics. And this is something I've been interested in for a long time, as have many people here. How do you get one photon to flip a switch and tell a second photon what to do? Especially if you want that first photon to keep propagating and be part of a quantum computer or something like that. So if you could get pi optical nonlinearities, where one photon phase shifted a second photon by pi, You'd be done. As Misha Lukin says, you would rule the world. Uh, maybe now or soon he will rule the world thanks to Rydberg blockade nonlinearities. But along the way, when that seemed out of reach, there was a very interesting proposal by Bill Monroe, Kainamoto, Tim Spiller, and some others um, that suggested that even if you had what they considered a weak nonlinearity, maybe a pi over a thousand phase shift instead of pi, you could still make essentially deterministic quantum computers out of that. And the idea was to have a kind of quantum bus where instead of making two photons, two qubits interact with each other, one photon would interact with some coherent state, maybe a million photons. And if it wrote a pi over a thousand phase shift, well, with a million photons, you can see a pi over a thousand phase shift. But don't measure it. Let that bus interact with a second qubit so that now the bus is looking at some combination of the state of this qubit and the state of that one. So you can measure some joint property of the two. And in that way, you can entangle them. And that, that part of the idea is reasonably straightforward. To figure out why that actually lets you do deterministic quantum computation, what measurements and feedback you should do afterwards, that's trickier. But they went through it, and they showed that if you could do this, that would be fine. Which now means that there's really no theoretical stumbling block at all. Because I can always just make n bigger and bigger. And as long as I can measure the phase shift, I'm done. The only question is the practical one. Can I actually measure this pi over 1,000 phase shift on my million photon state? It's one thing to say it's the quantum noise limit. But if I told you the nonlinearity was 10 to the minus 10, why don't you just go build a 10 to the 20 photon state and measure the 10 to the minus 10 radian phase shift? You'd probably say that might not work. But there's no fundamental stumbling block. It's just a question of where are the technical limitations. So the kinds of experiments we're thinking about look sort of like this. You have some cross-phase modulation medium. In our case, this will be called rubidium atoms, but it doesn't really matter. And a signal photon goes through there or not. And we want to see if that writes a phase shift on a second beam, some probe beam. So the probe will be set up in some sort of interferometer so we can measure a phase shift. And what we're interested in is just, can we measure that phase shift due to a single photon going through here? Right. So what's the origin of the phase shift? Here's the simple idea. Think of a probe going through a cloud of atoms. 
tuned to some two-level transition. That means its index of refraction has this familiar Lorentzian profile. And we'll sit right at the middle where the real part of n just goes to 1. But now let's add a signal photon. And we're going to do that by coupling this level to some third atomic level. And we'll be off resonance over here. But as this signal photon goes through, the electric fields will lead to what's known as an AC Stark shift or a light shift. It'll shift these two energy levels, making them repel. And when it does that, imagine that you're the probe photon. You've just been shifted off resonance. Right? This two-level resonance got shifted over here to the right. And that means you see a new index of refraction. And as you propagate through this medium, you'll get a phase shift. That's roughly speaking proportional to the intensity of that signal field, proportional to how much AC Stark shift you got. So the AC Stark shift changes the effect of detuning, and that changes the index of refraction experienced by the pulse. There was a clever scheme a little over 20 years ago um, to enhance this using electromagnetically induced transparency. So for those of you who are familiar with electromagnetically induced transparency, you either already know this or it's obvious. For those of you who don't, this is just looking a little more complicated. But the idea is by adding one extra coupling beam and one extra atomic level, you can turn a normal absorptive line shape, this, this dashed line, into one that has a transparency window written right in the center. And that narrow feature in absorption also turns into a narrow feature in dispersion. So you get this very sharp slope right at the middle. And Imamoglu's idea was that because of that sharp slope, you could have even more sensitivity to the AC Stark shift, get a bigger nonlinearity, bigger <coughs> Kerr effect. And you could do it in a region where you were transparent to the light you were sending through. So you get to have your cake and eat it too. Now, the narrower the transparency window, the larger the cross phase shift you get. But at the same time, to get a big phase shift, you want a big intensity on the signal. And remember, the signal I'm thinking about is a single photon. So I can't increase its energy. I can increase its intensity. I'll focus it down as tightly as I can. Or I could make it shorter, shorter in time. right? But if I make it shorter in time, it's broadband. And if I have this narrow transparency window and a broadband signal, you might get a little worried. And actually, I wasn't worried about this. But Tillman Pfau was visiting us on sabbatical and kept telling me our idea would never work. Is he said, look. You're going to have a 7 megahertz single photon. At the time, we wanted to do this from an OPO we have that makes single photons tuned to the rubidium transition. And you're going to try to make, I don't know, 100 kilohertz EIT window. They're just not going to fit into it. And I said, that's OK. We're not going to put the narrow band, uh, sorry, we're not going to put the broadband single photon in the EIT window. This whole thing is symmetric. We'll put our narrow band probe in the EIT window. And the broadband single photon off on the other transition doesn't have this problem. And Tillman said, yeah, it all sounds good, but that's just not how it works. If you've got an EIT bandwidth of 100 kilohertz, that's the bandwidth of the process you're using. And it's going to have some kind of 10 microsecond-ish response time. You're not going to be able to send a 40 nanosecond pulse through there and get it to react quickly. And in fact, there were these earlier papers that had kind of studied that. But they studied this in a different regime. Uh, they studied this for a sharp edge as opposed to a Gaussian pulse. And when we thought about it, we realized there were some subtleties. It actually took us a while to analyze theoretically and a little longer to analyze experimentally. But we realized that everyone is right. There is a downside to having the um, short pulses. But it's not so bad. It turns out that here is the cross phase shift versus time after a pulse goes through. And the pulse is, I don't know, 40 or 100 nanosecond, yeah, 40 nanoseconds long. And as we narrow the EIT window, at first, you see the phase shift gets bigger and bigger. And then as we go too far and we're beyond this bandwidth, the peak phase shift stops growing. All right, That was true. That's the result of John Howell's experiments. You can't make the phase shift get bigger anymore. But since the response time of the medium is slower, it keeps that phase shift for longer. It just has a longer memory time. So we still gain. As we lower the EIT window, we don't get a bigger phase shift, but it lasts longer. And my job is just to measure the thing. I don't actually care how big the peak phase shift is. I care about how easy it is to tell whether it happened or not. So there's still an advantage, depending on what you hold constant, to uh, going into this regime of narrower and narrower EIT windows. That was a pleasant discovery for us. And we ended up in a kind of uh, compromise regime. So let me show you the experiment now where we use that and really observe the nonlinear effect of a single photon. <coughs> 
we have laser-cooled rubidium-85. We have this extra beam for the EIT that probably shouldn't come in at 90 degrees, but practically we had some limitations. And then we have two telescopes so that we have a counter-propagating signal pulse coming from the left here focused down on the atoms, probe pulse coming from the right. Roughly speaking, you focus so the Rayleigh range is about the size of the atom cloud. That's an optimum in some regimes. And then we look at this probe pulse and we measure its phase. All right. So for the people who are concerned about that statement, the probe pulse actually has two frequency components. So the measurement is a kind of frequency domain interferometer. That lets us cancel out a lot of background fluctuations. And here's what we see is we change the average photon number in our signal pulse. We get this linear behavior. If we have too many photons, we saturate the atoms. But we can go all the way down to one photon per pulse on average. And we see about a 15 microradian phase shift. It's small. I think we could do at least 10 times better, hopefully 100 times better. But to me, what was exciting is this was, I think, the first time in free space that the phase shift actually due to a single photon pulse had been measured, or at least single photon average intensity. Now, we'd like to know what a real single photon, like a heralded single photon does. At the time, our heralded single photon source just wasn't bright enough that we'd be able to get enough signal to measure that small a phase shift. So we're still moving towards that, except for the fact that our vacuum chamber broke. But once it's rebuilt, we're moving towards that again. Uh, but we started thinking, we had here a pulse with about five photons. We saw a 60 microradian phase shift, had a pulse with two photons, and then we did one with one photon. But what if we kept going? What if you have a pulse with half a photon? How much phase shift do you see? Obviously, there are no pulses with half a photon, right? A pulse with half a photon means, roughly speaking, half the time I've got vacuum and half the time I've got a photon. It's not exact. It's a Poisson distribution, right? But that, that's close. But remember, this thing is transparent. So after the photon goes through, I can send it to a detector and just check, did I have a photon or not? So that's what we did. We sent in half a photon. And afterwards, we sent it to a detector. And if the detector clicked, we measured the phase. And if the detector didn't click, we measured the phase. When the detector didn't click, this red spot is our average phase. And when it does click, this blue spot is our average phase. So we're now actually seeing the phase shift due to a quantum of light. You don't have to trust my calibration that I think there was one photon per pulse there. This is when the detector clicks, you see a phase shift because of that click. Now, we wanted to push that further. and We wanted to do the math carefully. And we found something that really did surprise me, which is shown in these curves. Suppose I send in a coherent state pulse with this average photon number, it's a Poisson distribution of photon number. And then I have some inefficient detector that either fires or doesn't fire. If it were 100% efficient and didn't fire, you'd say there was no photon, right? But if it's only 10% efficient after all the coupling and it doesn't fire, you revise your estimate down by about 10%. You say, I used to think there was one photon, but now that the detector didn't fire, I'll hedge my bets. So I'll say, on average, 0.9 photons. That's actually the right thing to do. I can do that calculation. And I, I like classical statistics, so I did it that way. My students don't trust classical statistics. They spent a week doing the quantum calculation. The answers are the same, as they should have known. Um, <coughs> If you get no click, you get some estimate of the number of photons. But here's the surprise. If you do get a click, you should increase your estimate by one. And if you leave out some background effects or multiple photon cases, it doesn't matter how many average photons there were. If there were two and you had over here, I don't know, 30%, so you revise it down to 1.4, it goes to 2.4 after you get that click. It surprised me at first, but quantum optics people shouldn't be surprised if they think for a moment. Because how do you model an inefficient detector? You imagine that your coherent state came in, and maybe somewhere intrinsically you have a 100% efficient detector. But to hit that detector, the photon has to first go through a beam splitter. So there's some transmission eta that gets detected, and everything else, 1 minus eta, is reflected. All right, so that's a good way to model our inefficient detector. But now think what happens when a coherent state comes in to such a beam splitter. It gives you a product state of root eta alpha over here, root 1 minus eta alpha over here. That's a product state, which means what? It means that there is no way you can get more information about one side by making a measurement on the other side. Right? These are now independent states. So I make a measurement over here of whether there is zero photon or one photon in this root eta alpha branch. But the number of photons here, my best estimate of the number of photons there, is still 1 minus eta times alpha squared. That's not going to change. 
So how many total photons do I have? On average, I've got 1 minus eta times alpha squared over here. But over here, I just measured whether I have 0 or 1. So that's the answer. If the detector doesn't click, I have 1 minus eta times the original number. If the detector does click, I have one more than that. That's it. So we did that experiment. And each of these points, you see the red spots tell you what happens if the detector doesn't click. The blue spots tell you what happens if it does. And every time the detector clicks, in addition to the background, you get the phase shift of one more photon. That click tells you, I know there was an extra photon. And just to be sure that we weren't you know, doing something silly electronically, we did things like change the sign of the detuning so everything flips sign as it should be, so it does seem to be an atomic effect. We turned off various things. Well, we turned the detuning up to 300 megahertz, so we're just nowhere near the resonance, and nothing happens. We turn off the signal pulses, but we still get some clicks every now and then, so we could see if it was some kind of electrical uh, reflections, but no effect without the signal pulses. Turn the signal pulses back on, but get rid of the MOT. Doesn't work without atoms. So it really does seem to be this nonlinear effect. So that was part two or three or something of, of this experiment. That's where we saw the effect of the individual photons. But now I want to think about amplifying them. And the question here is, now that I'm arguing that the detector tells me of the existence of one photon, can I say something about where it was beforehand? How much can you say about the past in quantum mechanics, about post-selected states? And this has been a big issue in quantum measurement and quantum information. And this is really where I'm going to get to my punchline, that the single photon can have the effect of 1,000 photons. So this goes back to a question that Aharonov has been worrying about for decades. Um, there's something called the aharonov bergman leibowitz rule from the 1960s. But the more interesting stuff that's been kind of controversial starts with this 1988 paper. And the question just amounts to the following. Suppose I prepare some system in some state I, and later on I tell you that I found it in some state F. And now I ask you, what was happening in between I and F? What was the value of some observable A? How much can you say about that? The way we're all taught quantum mechanics, we're told, well, you take I, you propagate forward with Schrodinger equation, you measure A. And when you measure A, you know, the gates of heaven break loose, and there's thunderbolts and lightning and irreversibility, and Bohr tells you not to think about what happened, and then we think about the future later. And Aharonov and his friends argued, actually, the Schrodinger equation is time reversible. Why shouldn't I begin with state F, propagate it backwards in time, and use that to tell something about A? Or why shouldn't I use both? And I think scientifically, this is a really basic and really important realization. You know, every one of us in our everyday lives uses what we see now as evidence about what happened in the past. Again, I'll refrain from political jokes. Um, so if you know how you set up your laboratory, and you know that you know when you came back to the lab in the evening, the vacuum chamber had exploded, you would make some inferences about the intervening events based on both of those pieces of information. And we should be able to do that in quantum mechanics as well. So normally, why do we have trouble doing it? It's because of those thunderbolts when you make this measurement, that irreversible, uncontrollable disturbance. And in this paper with Albert and Feidman, Ahonov proposed that if instead of measuring A really well, interacting very strongly with a probe, you were very gentle about it. You might not get very much information about A, but you wouldn't disturb the system. And then it would be fair to think about this coherent evolution. So in terms of measurement theory, what they did is they went back to von Neumann's picture of measurement, which is that you're going to take your quantum system and couple it to a needle, you know, something on a dial that moves and tells you the value of what you're trying to measure. And although everything in the world is described by quantum mechanics, if you want a good needle pointing somewhere, you're going to make it a really narrow wave packet so that it almost has a definite position. And von Neumann showed that if you allowed this pointer to interact through this Hamiltonian with the system, it would move by an amount proportional to this thing A that you're trying to measure. And if A was in a superposition of many different values, well, the pointer would move to many different positions, all entangled with the system. So this is how measurement entangles measuring apparatuses and quantum systems. And it's that entanglement that in modern you know, quantum information influenced language gives you the decoherence or the collapse or the back action. All right? Another way of thinking about it is that this pointer had to be really well localized in position to make a really good measurement on one shot. 
But it obeys the uncertainty principle. If it's well localized in position, it has a huge uncertainty in its momentum. And if you look at this interaction Hamiltonian, that's the pointer momentum sitting there. So from the point of view of the particle, you've just given it a Hamiltonian with a big random number inside the Hamiltonian. So the measurement really does look like noise from the perspective of the particle. If only you could make p less uncertain, it wouldn't look like noise anymore. But if you make p less uncertain, you've got to make x more uncertain. And that's the Ahonoff Albert Weidman proposal. It says begin with a pointer that's really uncertain. It'll shift by a little bit. On a single shot, you won't be able to tell that. OK. We all know that in experiment, right? How many experiments have you done where you took one data point and went home? Right? Normally, we average for a reason. We're used to this stuff. So you take lots of measurements, and you map out what this bell curve looks like, and you figure out where its peak is. That is a measurement result. But what they showed is that this interaction had almost no effect on the system. It left the system in the same state it began in. You just shift the pointer and remained a good approximation in a product state. No decoherence at all. And you can now post-select. So here's the cartoon picture. We've got some system that I'll represent by this odd wave function. And we're going to couple it to a pointer, but the pointer is now in a superposition of pointing all over the place. There's huge uncertainty. We'll let the things talk to each other. And then I'll say, well, I haven't disturbed the system, so let me ask my second question. Let me ask if it's in state F, this green state over here, which I like and then a green light will go on. Or in this state, I don't care about, in which case I'll discard it. I'm only going to look at cases where I got my post-selection result, because that's what I want to know about. So we do this over and over again, and sometimes we get the right post-selection result. And then we look at the pointer and record where it was pointing. Other times, we get the bad one. We say, all right, never mind that. And sometimes, again, it succeeds. And we build up a histogram. Where are all these pointers? And we ask, on average, how much did the system move the pointer when the post-selection succeeded. In some sense, operationally, that's all a measurement can be. What is the average shift to the pointer? So we find this shifted Gaussian, and it has a peak, and we measure where that peak is. And you can use the standard rules of quantum mechanics to calculate where it should be. And that's what they did in 88. And that's the formula they got. <coughs> and mathematically, it looks kind of related to expectation values. It's A sandwiched between some states. But you see it's sandwiched between I and F. So it knows just as much about the initial state as the final state. And it has this funny denominator <clears throat> that's the overlap between I and F. So I could talk for a long time about interesting properties of this and what makes it a reasonable quantity to think about. For instance, if you don't do post-selection, it obviously reduces to the expectation value if F and I are equal. Um, and it has a lot of other interesting features. But it also has some disturbing ones. And yet, to me, it's the best operational definition of what could we say about A if we wanted to do the post-selection. Well, you let A couple to some other system, and you try to do that without disturbing your own system too much. And then you do the post-selection and see how much it shifted the pointer by. What else does a measurement mean but what is the average shift to a pointer? Well, here's one of the disturbing features. This was the title of the paper I keep alluding to how the result of a measurement of a component of the spin of a spin 1 half particle can be 100. The problem is this denominator can be as small as you like. So if I choose f and i to be almost orthogonal, my average pointer shift could be huge, way outside the eigenvalue spectrum of the thing I'm trying to measure. And that leads a lot of people to say, let's stop discussing this. And it leads other people to say, well, let's try to do the experiment. and Let's think about what this means. But it's a real physical prediction about the coupling to a pointer. And a bunch of people have discussed whether it could be useful for something. Honor Hosten and Paul Quiat did the first experiment using this to make a small effect seem bigger so they could measure something more precisely. In their case, the uh, spin Hall effect for light that hadn't been previously measured. And more recently, John Howell with Andrew Jordan's theoretical support has done a whole lot of work on really using this for precise measurement. And as I said, we can argue later about whether it's actually useful or not, but it's certainly provocative. So here's my version, how the result of the measurement of the number of one photon can be 1,000. If we take our photon, this signal beam, and instead of just sending it through our cloud of atoms, we split it into an interferometer with two paths, it's a two-state system that looks exactly like a spin 1 half mathematically. So all of the predictions from Aharonov's paper, the spin 1 half, they apply directly to this. So what's my initial state? I'll send a photon through a 50-50 beam splitter. So it's in a superposition of paths A and B. 
a minus b over root 2, let's say. And now I'm going to do a post selection. I'm going to recombine them at another beam splitter that's not quite 50-50, 50, 50, 50 plus or minus delta. So the final state will be Ra plus Tb. If it were 50-50, then my denominator, my overlap, would go to 0. Instead, it'll just get small. And if in between I ask how many photons are in arm B, because that's what determines the phase shift my probe is going to see, right? A probe is basically doing a quantum non-demolition measurement of the photon number. Um, all I have to do is measure the projector onto path B. And if you measure the projector onto path B, plug it into that weak value formula, you find a T over root 2 in the numerator, but you find something in the denominator that almost goes to 0. It depends on this delta, the deviation from a 50-50 beam splitter. So the expectation value, the weak expectation value of the photon number in arm B, even if I only send in one photon, goes as 1 over delta. In other words, if I make this a sufficiently dark port, every time a photon triggers that detector, I expect a phase shift, an effect on my pointer, this probe beam, that is huge. It could be 1,000 or anything like that. This was the theoretical proposal, and the experiment has now been done, but it's currently under review. I'll show you what it looks like. This is the photon in the hand is worth 1,000 in the vacuum chamber, but that 1,000 turns out to be base 2. We couldn't quite get to 1,000 decimal. So we now want to take the signal, put it in an interferometer, and have half of it go through the atoms and half not go through the, uh, the atoms. Doing that spatially would have led to a whole lot of instability, so instead we do this in polarization. And the trick with polarization is that if our probe beam is sigma plus polarized, as it is, then if you just go through the Klebsch-Gordons, you find out that a signal beam that's also sigma plus polarized gives you a much larger AC Stark shift than one that's sigma minus polarized. So the probe beam is almost only measuring the number of sigma plus photons. Small correction due to the sigma minus photons but it's much more sensitive to the sigma plus. So that's going to be our interferometer. We'll send in linear polarization. It's got equal parts of the strongly interacting and the not strongly interacting polarization. The probe beam will go through, get affected by that. And then before we detect our photon here, we'll choose a certain polarization that will be not quite linear. It'll be just slightly elliptical, almost orthogonal to the original state, but not quite. And when we do that, we find that as we change delta, that detuning from the dark port criterion, the measured phase shift goes up and up and up. Our single photon phase shift in this case was only about uh, 8 microradians because half the photons were just in the wrong polarization. And we see as much as a 60 microradian phase shift if we only post-select the signals that make that detector fire. So in that sense, the average photon that got to the right detector led to a nonlinear phase shift that was eight times larger than the single photon phase shift itself. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think it's interesting that that happens. It tells us something about how we should think about what particles were doing before they got to certain post-selections. You can't have a really classical image of the trajectory the particle was taking to its final detector. But you can use these quantum weak values to come up with estimates of how much it would have affected different measuring apparatuses. So I had a bunch of slides on whether or not this is practical. And I think I don't want to go through them very slowly. I'll flash up some titles, and then I'll get to the, the page where I give my version of the story. Um, but I mentioned these experiments before by Quiot's group and, and Howell's group. And the idea is, if you make that denominator really small, then even if your coupling constant is weak, you can end up with a big shift. That's kind of our regime. You know, eight microradians was hard to measure. 60 microradians, a little easier to measure. Maybe it's a good idea to do this post-selection and get a bigger signal. Well, a lot of people, like Ferry and Coombs in particular, argued that, no, that's completely wrong. And in fact, this isn't quantum at all. And Pussy came back and said, yes, it is quantum. And Lev Weidman came back and said, these guys don't know what they're talking about. And a few years later, Howell and Jordan and so forth are still writing papers saying, remember that advantage that doesn't exist? We're going to quantify it for you. So um, here's the short version. The weak value goes as 1 over this overlap. 
The thing is, the probability of finding the particle in state f goes as the square of that overlap. So if I make that overlap one-tenth, I can make my signal 10 times bigger, but I get 100 times less data. And we're back to our root n problem. If I have 100 times less data, my uncertainty is going to be 10 times worse. So the signal got 10 times bigger, so did my uncertainty. It's a wash. When I first did that calculation, I was surprised you didn't lose more than that. You know, it's interesting. You can get all the available information in 1% of the data set if you do your post-selection right. I don't know what that's good for, although my students periodically try to come up with things about smaller you know, hard drives or less bandwidth or whatever. And if Saren starts doing weak measurements, maybe this will be a good idea. Um, however, what people immediately started saying is, oh, you're making an argument about statistical noise. But there are things you just can't beat. Like, you know, what if my pixel is 10 microns across? I just can't measure a shift smaller than 10 microns, so I'll need to do this amplification. Well, that's not really true. If you, if you know how to do things and you fit an image over many pixels, you can measure the uncertainty <laughs> to less than a pixel. But there may be other kinds of noise that really are technical as opposed to statistical. And my best understanding of this is that the reason you get this 1 over root n is because you're averaging uncorrelated things. You've got a random walk going on. But if your noise is due to some slowly fluctuating field, and you start taking data faster and faster, then eventually you're taking more and more data points before the value of the noise field has had a chance to change. It doesn't help you anymore. You can average as many values of the same thing as you like. It's not going to start averaging out to zero if it's not fluctuating. So there's no point in taking data faster than the correlation time of your noise at some level. So once you're in that regime where you've got many points per noise correlation time, you can actually throw most of them away, so that wasn't going to help me in any case, and amplify the signal. So in that regime, I think there really is an advantage to doing this so-called weak value amplification. Advantage over just doing dumb averaging. Okay? The other paper said things like, this doesn't saturate the kramer rao bound. You know, they didn't say it's not better than the thing we normally do. They said it's not optimal, which wasn't the question I cared about yet. Right? Um, and in fact, their optimal thing requires you to build all the same hardware that this does. So the other practical question is, do I need a second detector? Do I need coincidence electronics? Not which post-processing should I do once I have that, you know, but should I build that at all? And the answer is you should build it. But there are a few different things that you can do. And it turns out that as you increase this rate of, of data, at some point, stupid averaging saturates when you've got one photon per um, correlation time. And the weak value amplification keeps growing in signal to noise until you've got one post-selected photon per noise correlation time. And uh, there are other techniques that are optimal that do a little better. It turns out one of those techniques is essentially lock-in amplification. If you do lock-in amplification, you're already using correlations in the noise in some sense. So what I found interesting is to realize that this weak value amplification and throwing data out is actually mathematically very similar to lock-in amplification, even though it sounds different. You're looking at correlations between data and different aspects of the data. And whether there is some case where experimentally it's easier to use this amplification technique than others. I think that remains an open question. I don't have a killer app to recommend to you, but I don't think we should dismiss it out of hand just yet either. So that, as I said, was the, the main topic. Um, I will say that if, you, if our paper is ever published and you read the last paragraph, you'll discover that we were surprised to learn when we did the post-selection, the uncertainty in our phase shift went down from 18 plus or minus 4 microradians to 10 plus or minus 0.6 microradians. So when we started doing weak value amplification, we actually did get a lower uncertainty on this sort of coupling constant we were interested in all along. And the reasons are subtle, and it depends on how you count resources. But practically, without even trying to do this, we actually found our uncertainty did go down. So if I can just talk for a few more minutes, I'll show you our dessert. This is the Bogolyubov excitation of a Panacotta. And uh, some of you know that uh, ever since the PhD that Steve alluded to, I've been obsessed with tunneling times. And I want to know if a particle tunnels through a barrier and then looks at its watch, how much time did it spend inside the forbidden region? And this has been a little bit controversial since 1932 and very controversial since 1982. 
And sometime around 2000, I think everyone got sick of it, so you don't hear as much about it anymore. But periodically, some new experiment gets people talking again on, uh, no, sorry, not on Rie. Um, all right, someone whose name I'm blocking on, who's famous for at a second science and ultra fast work, is actually doing measurements of tunneling times at the moment using uh, ionization. It's very interesting. But all I want to do is say, we're trying to set up an experiment that was kind of proposed by Boudicca, where you use a magnetic field to probe how long a spin is in a barrier. Instead of a spin interacting with a magnetic field, we're going to uh, let a particle go through a barrier and in different regions try to get its spin to rotate, but using Raman transitions and cold atoms. And here's one of the predictions. If you look at different regions in the barrier, you find that the reflected particles only ever see the beginning of the barrier. But if you post-select and look at the transmitted particles, the ones that actually got through, you'll find out that they spent some time at the beginning, but to get out, they must have also spent some time at the end. And oddly enough, by some definitions, they spend exponentially little time in the middle. So these are all things that you can calculate, but it's never been seen experimentally, and I think it's the kind of thing we have to start exploring in the laboratory. Is, is there some imperceivable difference between the, the red and the dotted line curves? Yes, there is an imperceptible difference. The, if you look at all of them, it would be the weighted average of the red and green curves weighted by the transmission and reflection probabilities, which I think are about 99% and 1% in this curve. So there should be a 1% correction there. So here's the idea of the experiment. We start with the BEC. You might just think of dropping the BEC onto a sheet of light that repels the atoms. Look at the transmitted ones and see what's happened. We have trapped atoms on top of a sheet of light. I just like this for the video. Um, my students are good with acronyms. The REST trap, I think that's the repulsive sheet trap. So it's a sheet of light and atoms sitting on top of it until they spill over the edges, or some of them actually tunnel through the middle. What you see here is not the tunneling. That's the ones that were too hot and were never trapped to begin with. When you see nothing at all, though, there are still atoms tunneling, and those are the ones we want to look at. We've now gotten more controlled. We put the atoms in a cross dipole trap. Uh, we put a barrier through the dipole trap. We're going to add Raman beams that can then cause the fictitious spin, or the real spin actually, to rotate. And then we'll give them a little kick. Some will get transmitted, some will get reflected. And we'll look at the transmitted ones and see what happened to the hyperfine state. How long were they interacting with those Raman beams? And that'll be a measurement of the tunneling time. So we've got the Raman beams working. We've seen tunneling. This is a collaboration with Lincoln Carr where we saw the whoops, effect of the mean field energy on tunneling. And most recently, we've got them going through an individual barrier. But just for the hell of it, we realized we could easily turn that single barrier into a double barrier. And we thought, maybe that'll be a Fabry Perot for atoms. So here's a movie that looks to us like it's a Fabry Perot for atoms. Uh, time is increasing downwards. This is a wave packet that we shot from the right at a little double barrier about a micron across. And as they hit that barrier, some are transmitted, some are reflected. But then there's this little dot that seems to stay trapped. And we think that's the atoms that happen to be on resonance with the fabry perot So we're going to start studying that as a filter and try to actually determine what its coherence time is and things like that. So that's more or less where those experiments stand. Those are just more pretty pictures. Um, we did one measurement of this Larmor clock, this kind of time measurement, but without the tunnel barrier. So this is just atoms traveling through free space. And we measured how much does the spin rotate depending on how fast they get fired at that region. And I was very proud of this because we confirmed a very important formula, not to very high precision, but the time spent in the region seems to go as one over the velocity. So now we'll see whether that breaks down in the tunnel barrier. And I will just leave you with my conclusions. Thank you for your attention.